we present Peter Cook and Marjorie Westbury in the Francis Durbridge serial Paul Temple and the Margot Mystery. Episode 2 Concerning Ted Angus. We picked a girl out of the river about two hours ago. She'd been strangled. It was George Kelburn's daughter. Julia oh. Kelburn? Yes, but that isn't everything. The dead girl was wearing a coat. There was a name on a label stitched inside the collar. We've seen that name before. Margot? Yes, Mrs. Temple. Margot. I see. Now, let's think this out. About a week ago, Steve was kidnapped by persons unknown and then suddenly released. Yes. Our only clue was a coat found in Steve's car. Inside the coat was this name, Margot. And we tried to trace the name but failed. This morning, however, we came across the name again on Julia Kelburn. Hmm. Well, there's one person who won't be surprised by the murder, Superintendent. That's Julia's stepmother, Linda Kelburn. Well, why do you say that? She telephoned and made an appointment to see me at nine o'clock this morning. When I asked her why she wanted to see me, she said it was about Julia who was going to be murdered. What time did Mrs. Kelburn telephone you? About three o'clock this morning. Well, this is extraordinary. I've seen Mrs. Kelburn about an hour ago. I went to the house in Eden Square. She didn't say anything about telephoning you. On the contrary, she seemed staggered by the news of the murder. She never mentioned the phone call. Well, not a word. How did Mr. Kelburn react? Well, he was pretty badly shaken, of course, but I had the impression he'd been worried about his daughter for some time. She mixed with a pretty shady crowd, you know. Yeah, she was friendly with a man called Tony Wyman. Yes, I'm checking on Mr. Wyman. I've got an appointment to see him. Oh, excuse me. Hello? Paul Temple? Yes, speaking. This is Mike Langdon. I got some terrible news. Oh, we've heard about Julia Kelvin. The superintendent's with me now. Oh? Then I expect he's told you all the details. Well, yes. It's a pretty awful business, Langdon. It must have been a shock for you. Yes, it was. It was a terrible shock. But, but look, Temple, I want to ask you a favor. Kelvin's determined that the person responsible for this shall not escape. He's anxious to make the fullest possible investigation. Expense no object. Well? Well, he'd like to see you. Does that go for Mrs. Kelvin, too? What do you mean? Well, would she like to see me? Why, yes, of course. I imagine so. She hasn't said anything otherwise. Uh -huh. Tell Mr. Kelvin I'll be there at 12 o'clock. All right. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. I'll be seeing you then. Yes. Goodbye, Langdon. Excuse my asking, Mr. Temple, but who is this man, Langdon? He's one of Kelvin's right-hand men. I met him on the plane coming over from New York. Kelvin had sent for him. He apparently thought Langdon might be able to reform his daughter. Really? I understand he'd got her out of one or two little scrapes in New York. All the way from New York because Kelburn couldn't cope with his own daughter? Mm. Sounds a bit far-fetched. Oh, I don't know. We never knew Julia Kelburn. We don't know what her father was up against. Oh, no, but still... However, Langdon's main job was to try and buy off Tony Wyman. Now, that's interesting. What happened? Wyman told Langdon he couldn't care less about Julia. Mm. This chap Langdon, is he about 50, going bald, about medium height? That's right. Ah, yes, he was hovering about when I interviewed Kelburn and his wife. You've no objection, I take it, if I go along and see Kelburn? Not the slightest, Mr. Temple, not the slightest. It's a free country, so they tell me. It isn't that I mistrust the police, Mr. Temple. I just think that a case of this kind demands a more imaginative approach than the average police inspector is capable of. Now, George, let me... Mr. Kelburn, Campbell... I've worked with the police now for many years, and I can assure you that the majority of men at Scotland Yard are shrewd, intelligent, and highly efficient. Efficient, yes, maybe, but slow, slow. That's the trouble, slow. My daughter's been murdered, Mr. Temple, my only child. I'll give anything to find the swine responsible for that murder. Just name the fee. You don't solve a case of this kind simply by paying someone a fat fee, Mr. Kelburn. The whole... Oh, there you are, Linda. Uh, Mr. Temple, may I introduce my wife? Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Kelvin? I believe you know Steve. I do indeed. Is she well? Uh, thank you, yes. She was looking forward to seeing you this morning. This morning? Yes. We were expecting you to call at nine o'clock as arranged, but obviously this business... I'm sorry, Mr. Temple, but I don't understand. Were you under the impression that my wife was coming to see you? I was indeed. What gave you that impression? The fact that she telephoned me in the early hours of the morning and said that she wanted to see me. I telephoned you? Yes. When? About three o'clock this morning. But that's nonsense. I can assure you that my wife didn't phone you, Mr. Temple. How are you so certain? Well, because we occupy the same bedroom. If she'd made a telephone call at that hour of the morning, I'd certainly have known about it. What exactly am I supposed to have phoned you about? You told me that you suspected that your stepdaughter was going to be murdered. She told you? Are you serious, Temple? But this is ridiculous. Wait a minute, George. 
This is the second time I'm supposed to have made a mysterious telephone call. I met your wife a couple of weeks ago, and she had some strange story about having spoken to me on the phone and my saying I wanted to see you. And you didn't want to see me? Of course not. I didn't even phone. Someone did. It certainly wasn't me. Mrs. Coburn, your husband has asked me to investigate this affair, and I think perhaps you might be able to help me. How exactly? Well, you can start by telling me where Julia bought her clothes. I'm afraid I don't know. Could you find out? Yes, I suppose so. I'm interested in the coat she was wearing at the time of the murder. There was a label inside with the name Margot on it. Margot? Yes. Does that name mean anything to you? No, I'm afraid it doesn't. But I'll make inquiries, if you like. I'd be grateful if you would. You have my phone number, Mrs. Kelvin, if you want to get in touch with me. Yes. No, I'm afraid I haven't. Oh, well, it's in the book. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a lunch appointment. Goodbye, Mrs. Kelvin. I hope to hear from you. Would you like some more coffee, sir? Uh, no, thank you. Very good, sir. Well, you had quite a morning. <laughs> what did you make of Linda Kelburn? Oh, she was pleasant enough in a brittle sort of way. Do you think she got on well with her stepdaughter? Yes, I think she did, and heaven knows that couldn't have been very easy. According to what Langdon was telling me on the way here, Julia was quite a handful. Paul, do you think the people who kidnapped me were responsible for the murder? Yes, I do. And I think I know why they kidnapped you, Steve. You do? Yes. While I was in America, a report appeared in one of the Continental newspapers that said... Well, I've got it in my wallet here. There you are. Read it for yourself. Oh. This is all about that man Superintendent Rain mentioned. Uh, the fence. Yes. Scotland Yard have asked you to help them discover his identity. And you've cut short your American tour in order to do so. Is this true, Paul? No, of course not. It's just a newspaper story. Sir Graham and I have never even discussed the fence. But you think that someone read this? I think the fence himself read it and believed it. Remember what that man said to you, Steve. We did it as a warning and to prove that it was possible, Mrs. Temple. Yes. From now on, you've got to watch your step, dear. Don't go anywhere on your own if you can help it. Yes, Don't... yes, I know. I know the routine. By Timothy, this traffic really is appalling. Relax, darling. I don't mind driving. Mm, I'm delighted to hear it. This is always the worst bit, anyway. Ah, that's better. We're on the move now. <laughs> it's all right, Steve. Your hat is on straight. My hat? Uh, I saw you staring in the mirror. As a matter of fact, I was looking at the car behind. The, the one driven by the young man in dark glasses? Yes, it was standing outside the house when I left, and it was behind me when I drove to the restaurant. Was it by Timothy? You don't recognize the young man? No, I don't. But it's difficult with those glasses he's wearing. Yes. Steve, take the next turn on the left. Quickly, darling. What's the idea, Paul? Yes, he's following us all right. Pull behind that lorry at the traffic lights. Get into the curb if you can. All right. What are you going to do? I'm getting out. You drive straight home, Steve. Yes, but what are you going to do? See you later, dear. Here, what's the big idea getting into my car like this? Keep going. I'll explain later. Go on, keep going. People are getting impatient. I don't give a monkey what people... Drive are... on. And there's no need to follow that car. I can tell you all you want to know about it. What are you talking about? I think you know what I'm talking about. Now, I suggest you drive into Regent's Park. We can have a little talk there. I... Yeah, all right, Mr. Temple. I should switch the engine off, Mr. Wyman. You recognise me, then? Yes. Now, why are you following us around? I've read a lot about you in the paper, Mr. Temple, and I thought... Well, I'm in dead trouble, see, and I thought maybe you... What is the trouble, Wyman? It's the police, Mr. Temple. They've put the wind up me. That Superintendent Rainey didn't half give me a going over. Practically accused me of doing a murder. You mean Julia Kelburn? Yeah, I, I never even knew she'd snuffed it. Straight I didn't. That chap Rain was at me for the best part of an hour, but all I could tell him was that I finished at the club just after one and I went straight home. Just how friendly were you with Julia Kelburn? Well, depends what you mean by friendly. Well, how did you meet her? 
Some of the gang, the regulars, brought to the club one night. Did you know her father was well off? Well, not at first. She never let on. But later she started throwing the lolly around and I guess somebody had the dough. She wasn't a bad kid. I was very fond of her in a funny sort of way, but, well... Well, she started getting in my hair, you know, hanging around the club, meeting me in restaurants, waiting for me at the telly studio. You don't know how it is. No, I don't know how it is. You tell me. Well, you know, well, she was a bit of a mixed-up kid. A bit dotty, perhaps, I don't know. Spent quids with one of them psychiatrists. Hmm? Who told you that? She did. She used to visit a doc in Wimple Street. Benkari, I think the name was. Yeah, that's right. Dr. Benkari. Did you tell the superintendent about this? No, nah, I didn't tell him more than was necessary. I know those flatfoots. When I was a kid in Bermondsey, I would... Hey, look at this car. He's coming straight on us. Get out, Wyman, quick! I can't open the ruddy door! Ah, <laughs> oh, there you are, Mr. Temple. How is Wyman, Doctor? Oh, he'll be all right. He got rather a nasty cut above his right eye, and he's shaken up quite a bit. I've given him a sedative. Must have been quite a spectacular little crash. Yeah, it was. And a deliberate one, too. Mm. Hello, Mr. Temple. Oh, hello. Are you feeling all right now? Yes, I'm fine, Superintendent. I was dead lucky. Well, you both were. Well, if there's nothing more, Mr. Temple, I'll get back to the ward. I'm much obliged, Doctor. Will Wyman be discharged? Oh, yes, yes. In about an hour or so, I should say. Oh, then I'll get a statement from him later. Thank you, Doctor. What about the other chap, the driver? He's at the station. Got off with a few bruises and a cut cheek. Who is he? Tough little Scott. Name of Ted Angus. Ted Angus? Mm. Do you know him? No, I don't think so. I've been on to Glasgow. They know him up there, but they've never been able to get anything on him. I'm afraid we'll only be able to hold him for an hour or two. What's he do for a living, if anything? Oh, he's done all sorts of things. Barker in a fairground, travelling salesman, wall of death rider. Mm. According to Glasgow, he's suspected of being mixed up in one or two smash-and-grab jobs, but he's always got clear. You know, I can hardly think it was you he was after... It was Wyman's car. Mm, maybe you're right. I'd like to phone my wife, then perhaps I could have a word with Angus. Yes, of course. You can phone Mrs. Temple from the station. I tell you, it was an accident. The steering went completely. Couldn't you see me trying to twist the wheel? I don't think you're telling the truth, Angus. Here, do you think I ran around crashing into people I've never seen? I think you might, if the money was big enough. You're lucky there isn't a witness to hear you say that. Who do you think you are, anyway, coming in here and insulting an innocent man? My name's Paul Temple, and it's only by a stroke of luck that I'm here at all. Oh, you're the writer, fella. Now, why should I want to do you any harm? That's what I'm asking you, Angus. Who told you to run a stand? Nobody. Nobody at all. Then perhaps your instructions were to smash up Tony Wyman. Tony Wyman? You mean the laddie who sings in the telly? Mm. I'm one of his fans. What's your job? I'm a car driver. Who's your boss? I'm unemployed at the moment. Then what were you doing driving that car? Just driving it across London for a friend of mine. He owns a garage. What garage? The two counties at Mill Hill. Did you tell the police that? Yes, and they checked it. They've checked everything. I tell you, you're wasting your time, mister. It was just an accident. Accident or not, Angus, I'll give you one last word of advice. These people you're working for are ruthless. I keep telling you I'm not working for anybody. When you've served your turn, they'll ditch you sure as fate. And they won't be too gentle about it, either. I can take care of myself. Yeah, I hope you can. Finished your talk? Yes. When are you let me out of here? The sergeant will be along in a minute for a few more details. Then you can go. I should ruddy well think so, treating me like a criminal. Come along, Mr. Temple. Uh, uh, Mr. Temple? Yes? Have you heard how young what's-his-name is? His name's Wyman. I thought you were a fan of his. He's very scared, Angus. You can tell your employer you made a good job of it. Now, what do you make of him? He's about as straight as the Tower of Pisa. It's a pity you can't hold him, Rain. Yes, but we can't. He stuck to his story about the steering being faulty. And it might have been, of course. It was buckled to blazes. Timothy, Steve, you're in a depressing mood this evening. Yes, I know. I keep thinking about that car accident. It might have been fatal, darling. Well, it wasn't. <laughs> Cheer up. 
Well, I should have thought the police could have held that man Angus on some charge or other. Well, uh, yes, Johnny? I found it, Mr Temple. What's that? It's the telephone number you wanted. Ah, good. Here we are, sir. Dr. Benkari, 134 Wimpole Street. Ah, yes, that's it. Thank you, Charlie. Anything else, Mr. Temple? Uh, no, that's all, thanks. Leave the book. Right, sir. What's all this about? Tony Wyman told me that Julia Kelvin consulted a psychiatrist, Dr. Benkari. I thought it might be quite an idea if I had a word with him. Why? Well, for one thing, I'd like to know what she consulted him about. Uh, um, hello? Well, back 9291. Dr. Benkari's house? That's right. Um, can I speak to the doctor? Who is it speaking? My name is Temple. Right, hold on. What is it, Paul? What's the matter? Well, I could swear that the man on the other end, Steve, he sounded exactly like Ted Angus. Well, couldn't have been, surely. I mean, he... Hello? Who is that, please? Uh, is that Dr. Benkari? No, this is Dr. Benkari's secretary. The doctor's out of town. Oh, well, my name is Temple. I'd like to make an appointment. Then I suggest you phone again towards the end of the month. But surely... Any time it... after the 25th, I shall be pleased to make an appointment for you then. But I'm afraid that's Goodbye, too... Goodbye, Mr. Temple. Well, I'm blowed. What did he say? He cut me short and rang off. My Timothy, if he's the secretary, I wonder what the doctor's like. Yes, Charlie? There's a Mrs. Kelvin called. She says she'd like to see Mr. Temple. Oh, show her in, Charlie. Yes, Mr. Temple. Are you expecting Linda? No, but I told her to phone me if she had any information about where Julia bought her clothes... I thought... Per uh, Mrs. Calvin, sir. Hello, Linda. Hello, Steve. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Oh, Mrs. Calvin, let me get you a drink. No, I won't, thank you. I'm in rather a hurry. I'm dining with some people at Hampstead. Mr. Temple, I've made one or two inquiries about Julia's clothes, and oh. I've been through her wardrobe. Thank you. There's nothing with the name Margot on it, but I've discovered that most of her clothes, most of the respectable ones at any rate, were bought from a shop in Bond Street called Daphne Drake. Oh, I've heard of it. It's a very good shop. Yes, I think it is, although I don't go there myself. Did Julia have many clothes? Yes, she did. And she was a frightfully erratic sort of person. She'd probably wear nothing but jeans and a sweater for a month or so, and then suddenly buy herself half a dozen dresses and suits. There's no telling what she'd do. Unfortunately, it wasn't only her clothes that she was erratic about. What do you mean? Well, she wasn't exactly careful about her choice of friends, was she? No. Of course, the trouble was George wouldn't take her in hand. He wouldn't hear a word against her. Understandable, I suppose, but rather irritating at times. Did you try to take her in hand, Mrs. Kelvin? No, it wasn't my job. But you were quite good friends. Oh, yes, we were, considering. But the trouble really started when George got a bee in his bonnet about this Tony Wyman person and tried to lay the law down. It was too late. We just couldn't do that sort of thing with Julia. Tell her she couldn't have something and she'd immediately want it. Yes, I can understand that. How is your husband, Linda? He's still very upset, of course. It's been a terrible shock to him. Yes, of course. I suppose there's no news, Mr. Temple. The police have no idea who did it. No, at least I certainly haven't heard anything. Well, I must be going. I'm very grateful to you for calling. You'll let me know if you come across anything you think might be of any importance. Yes, of course. I certainly will, Mr. Temple. I'll see you out, Linda. Thank you, Steve. Well? I hope dear Linda enjoys her dinner. You didn't like her, did you, Paul? No. But I'm glad she called. I wonder if this Daphne Drake place is worth investigating. Well, I can tell you one thing. The coat that was left in my car at the airport wasn't bought from Daphne Drake's. How do you know? Oh, it isn't their sort of thing. They're much more expensive. They have some really lovely stuff. Hmm. You know, I think I ought to go along there tomorrow morning. Why? Well, to, to make a... Two inquiries? <laughs> I know the sort of inquiries you'd make. Still, it's not a bad idea. Thank you, darling. But, Steve? Yes, dear? One dress, one only, remember. I think the dress is perfect, madam. I really do. And the colour's adorable. If you'd like to try it on again, Mrs. Temple. No, please. I agree with you. It is a lovely dress. I... Mm, I'll take it. Thank you, Mrs. Temple. Shall we send it? Yes, please. I'll give you my address. It might take a day or two because of the alterations, but it shouldn't be very long. Now, is there anything else I can show you? I don't think so. Um, oh, a friend of mine has a coat that, that I've been envying for some time. She simply won't tell me where she bought it from. 
but there's a label inside the collar with the name Margot on it. Margot? Yes. Now, would that be the manufacturer or the retailer? I really couldn't tell you, Mrs. Temple. Margot? Yes. No, I'm sorry. I've never heard the name before. Of course, we have some very nice coats if you... Yes, what is it, Jane? Excuse me, Miss Elsie. The fitter says Dr. Ben Carey's coat is ready. She wants to know if the doctor's calling for it. No, no, I promised her we'd post it to the Westerton address. Oh, very good, Miss Elsie. Now, if you'll be good enough to come this way, Mrs. Temple, I'll show you some of our coats. We have a small but very lovely... I thought you were never coming. Did you buy up the whole shop? No, darling, I didn't. Uh, can I get you anything, madam? I'd like a dry martini, please. Uh, dry martini, and I'll have the same again, please. Yes, sir. Well, Steve? I've got some news for you, Mr. Temple. About Margot? No, they've never heard of the name. At least they say they haven't. But I'll tell you who they have heard of, Paul. Who? Dr. Benkari. Dr. Benkari? Yes. She's a customer of theirs. She? <laughs> yes, Took it for granted Ben Carey was a man. So did I. Oh, Timothy, I must watch my step. I'm slipping, Steve. Well, oh, go on, tell me, what happened? Dr. Ben Carey bought a coat from Daphne Drake's, and they were asked to post it to her. She's living in the country at a place called Westerton. Westerton? Mm. Where is that? It, it, the name seems familiar. It's in Kent, about 40 miles from here. Rather well, a nice little place. There's a very good pub there called the Red Heart. I used to know the landlord, a man called Harkett. Oh, I remember the Red Heart. We stayed there one weekend about oh, six or seven years yes, ago. Yes, that's right. Now I could ask you to autograph one of your novels. You spit the ink all over it. Yes, that's the chap. Steve, I'm very interested in this Dr. Ben Carey for several reasons. One, Julia Kelburn consulted her. And two, I still think it was that chap Angus who answered the telephone. Which means, I suppose, that we are going to spend the weekend at Westerton. Yes, darling, I'm afraid it does. Mr. Temple, a nice foaming tankard. Ah, thank you, Mr. Harkett. Still brewing your own beer, I'm glad to see. Ah, yes, that's our card. We get people from miles away, even from London, just to see what real beer tastes like. Ah. Uh, talking of people from London, have you come across a Dr. Ben Carey in these parts? You mean the lady doctor who took Miller's Croft in Wine Lane? Uh, yes, I should imagine that's the same person. Got a very nice place, they tell me. Hmm. Uh, Mrs. Fletcher, one of my regular customers, used to be the daily. Lovely place, she says it is. Hmm. You haven't met the doctor? No, just seen her around the village. Striking-looking woman. Oh. Has she many friends? Locally, I mean. No, I reckon Mrs. Fletcher knows her as well as most. Although she don't work for her now, hasn't been up there for almost a year. Always speaks well of the doctor, though, does Mrs. Fletcher. Says she's a real lady. Where is Vine Lane? It's about uh, about four miles from here. The cottage stands on its own. Wouldn't be another house for about, uh, about a quarter of a mile. It sounds very lonely. Oh, it is, Mrs. Temple. But, but it's very pretty. Mr. Arcourt. Uh, come in, Maisie. Excuse me, Mr. Temple. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, let me know what you think of the beer, sir. Yes, all right, I will. Are you going to see this, Mrs. Fletcher? Well, I might do later, darling. It was a bit tricky. I don't want to attract too much attention. Well, what do you think of the beer, Steve? Mm. Hmm? Oh, well, two of these and I should certainly attract attention. <laughs> I should be spark out. <laughs> They certainly should be able to brew good beer in these parts. I've never seen so many hop fields. <laughs> What's that sign say, darling? Where? Oh, I see. Vine, what is it? Vine Lane. Ah, I think we'll park on the grass verge here and take a little stroll. Oh, it's getting rather dark. Oh, not very. In any case, I've got a torch. It'll do us good to stretch our legs. What is it you want to take a look at? The cottage? Yes. Well, don't expect me to tramp across fields in these shoes. <laughs> ah, Fred Harkett was right. It is pretty lonely. Do you want to go any further, Paul? We'll go just as far as that tree, Steve, and then we'll turn back. It's funny. We haven't seen the cottage. Yes. Wait a minute. 
I can see a light through the tree. Yes, yes, there it is. Ooh, still quite a long way away. Yes, and it looks to me as if... What was that? Someone calling. It's over there, behind the hedge. Yes. Give me your hand, Steve. Have you got the torch? Yes, come on. Oh, Paul. Why, Timothy. Do you know him? Yes. Who is it? It's Ted Angus. Ted Angus? Yes, just look at him. He's really been beaten up, poor devil. Don't hurt me. Please don't hurt me. No, no, it's all right, Angus. It's all right. No one's going to hurt you. This is Paul Temple. You remember? We met at the police station. Oh, I... I remember. Uh, Temple, listen. Yes, what is it? Temple, this is important. Ask... Ask Mrs. Fletcher about... About... Go on, uh, Angus, I'm listening. Ask Mrs. Fletcher about the coat. (laughs) 